All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to do our session on surface finishes. What else we have here? Gear shaping, and then all of our non-traditional machining processes. Not everyone out there, but the main ones that you commonly see. Anyhow, we'll go ahead and get started before you fall asleep. There we go. All right. <clears throat> surface finishes, reasons for measuring. Oh, so what they're showing you is, why do we measure surface finishes? Well, now with woodworking and that, you can sand it. Does it look good to the eye? Is it pretty smooth? Is it rough enough where it'll accept some stain and then you can put some uh, finish lacquer or something over it, polyurethane or whatever? That's okay, but when you got into the Industrial Revolution where we're mass producing things, making mechanized things, so different mechanisms out of metal, you had tighter tolerances because gears have to mesh and stuff like that. So, yeah, surface finishes matter. All right, so the reasons for measuring your surface finish is saves money by eliminating scrap and rework. Yeah, if you have the right finishes, everything fits together right. You don't have any issues. Something's really coarse, it wears against the other thing, it wears it out, and there's premature failure, and it may be under the warranty, and you lose money. So that's not good. We don't want to lose money, do we? So it saves money by increasing your wear life. All right, so anyhow, saves machining time by not over-finishing. That's the other thing. You may finish it and polish it too much, and you may over-finish it to where you make a part last 50 years in a car. Oh, the whole transmission and motor lasts a million miles, but the car shell around it rusted apart after 200,000. Well, what's the point? So, anyhow, improve saleability of product to if you have the right surface finish. So, visual surface texture measurement, you can look at it. All right, two surfaces appear to be exactly alike. That is, two surfaces appear to reflect the same amount of light. We only see portions of the surface that reflect the light. So that's what it's showing you there. I guess there's this... It shows one eye, so maybe it's a cyclops that's kind of watching this. You know, guy's got the eye in the middle of his forehead or something. All right, anyhow, we keep moving with this. Yeah, it is a cyclops. <laughs> uh, this uh, curved surface, C, is of substantially the same roughness as the flat surface of B, but because of its curvature, it reflects fewer light rays into the eye. Thus, surface C looks much smoother than surface B. Now, and if you think about it, if you look at like a car that has some flat lines to it, and you look down the side, and it may have some door dinks or scratches in that, you can see it all on the waviness of it. If the thing's curved, you know, or it bulges out, and the fenders and the wheel wells, so you know it's more of a racy looking car and they put big fat tires in the back and stuff like that. I've noticed that with a, one of my cars. It's really curved. And it's pretty wavy and dented, but you can't tell because the way it's curved. You get up close and you know you get you get the sun just right. And yeah, you can see it. Some of it I think is when they stamp and it kind of ripples the metal because it's so curved like that. But it's interesting how a car or you know anything for that matter is curved it looks that much sharper you know it's like us men you know we look at a girl with curt no, I'm just saying All right, but anyhow what I'm saying is if something is curved uh, you're you're just not gonna see as much if it's flat see how you can see kind of every ripple but when it's curved it just looks that much better because the way it reflects things. I don't know. I think it's just, well, you know, like they said with the light waves, but it's the way our eyes accept looking at that. And so at any rate, something with curves, I think aesthetically and whatever, it looks better to us. All right. Tactile surface, what's tactile? That's touch, right? So... What they do is, how rough something is, you take your fingernail, right? And then you can feel all the little scratches in it or something like that. Um, so you can say, well, gee, how rough is the surface? Well, that's good for a surface that's somewhat rough, but if it's finer, 
the roughness, the indentations in there, and then the thickness of your fingernail. Your fingernails are pretty thick. I cut mine the other day, so there's not much to look at here. But, I mean, if you look how thick a fingernail, I won't use the middle finger, that is this finger. But anyhow, if uh, use that middle, I mean, one of these fingers, and look at the fingernail, it's a few thousands of an inch thick, so if it's under a couple thousands of an inch thick, then it's hard to gauge it with your fingernails. See, like it's showing you here. That's how thick your fingernail is. I guess this is a gothic person. See, it's got the black fingernail polish there. All right, but anyhow. Then here is, for instance, the little uh, tip on a profilometer, that profile meter that we had seen in our other uh, lecture. And that was a portable one. There's all different sizes in that. And it's kind of like on the old phonographs. I tell people all the LPs and records that I have. And I think some of you are old enough to have those things. Uh, and the 78s, 45s, all those little records, the LPs, long playing albums, the big 12-inch ones. Uh, and I think they still call them albums. I was looking at that the other day. I heard somebody that was a little younger than I was that's in uh, the music business saying, yeah, that's the full length album there. Album, wow, I can't believe you're using that terminology. But anyhow, uh, I guess it's like a photo album. It's a collection of songs per se. So you can still use that name. All right, but anyhow, this is gonna get into all those nooks and crannies when if you look at this fingernail at camp. All right, ways to measure. Uh, Visual viewing, like I said, you can kind of look at things. Fingernails, not accurate, reliable, whatever, because I even look at my fingers, and some fingernails are thicker than others. My thumb fingernail is much thicker than the rest of them. And then some of your toenails, maybe, on the big toenail. Your big toe versus your little toe and all that stuff, and your pinkies and all that good stuff. And so we have our little profilometer to measure this. The profile meter. All right. Then we get into the different types of surface finishes. Roughness. Finely spaced surface irregularities established by the predominant surface pattern. Okay, so that's just the way it is. Uh, roughness height measures in micro inches. So that's what, six decimal places? Micro as in a millionth of an inch. Uh, average reading is taken above and below that center line. We had talked about that before. Uh, you get that arithmetic average, or as the guy in the video said, arithmetic average. But anyhow, uh, that's okay. Then you have your cutoff distance. It's usually a half inch or an inch that it measures. It does its little thing. And then, then it gives you the average of that automatically. It's all digital now. It's kind of nice. Waviness is uh, the irregularities with a mean line and the spacing is greater than the roughness. <clears throat> so then you're saying, what does that mean? Irregularities with a mean line in which spacing is greater than the roughness. So you can have your roughest, but then you have this waviness in it and waviness per se, we talk about the lay. So, you know, like you say, the lay of the land, uh, the pattern of that roughness of that, let's say our land, our piece. And that's like the feed pattern. So you can have this rough surface, but it may be in waves. And that's the lay pattern. And then it may be in sharper increments. And what that is, what they're saying is your feed pattern. So for instance, if you're, let's say, turning around stock of something on the lathe. Well, this isn't real round, but let's pretend it is. Let's say this is spinning, and you're turning it. And if this is turning super fast, and your cutter that's cutting it is going slow, it's barely moving, and this is going super fast, you're going to have a nice smooth finish. Let's say this is going slow, and your cutter is going faster than that is spinning you're going to create a helix or a screw thread on it. And that'll give you that lay pattern where you have the roughness. And then you have the lay pattern of your roughness. All right. The roughness is just the finish of your material. Just, that's just the way the material is. So again, here's our profile. 
Uh, here's our uh, waviness that goes um, to uh, because of the way of our feed pattern, how fast it was going, and then the lay going across, it's, it's showing you uh, on here is the pattern that you get on the way it's cut. So, for instance, so I'm not getting you totally confused. All right. Um, the lay is, if you look at it, if the tool cuts like back and forth in a reciprocating motion, you're going to get this pattern. See how it's kind of some deeper than the other. Then, as it cuts, it may move in deeper and then come back out. And then depending how fast it's fed, then you're going to see higher ridges and lower ridges. Uh, I mean, this makes it look like these are big hills here, like the, we're in the hill country, Texas, or even here in East Texas with all these hills and valleys and stuff like that. So what they're getting at is uh, you actually have the roughness of this depending on how smooth that tool texture is that's cutting it. Then you have that pattern of roughness, the lay pattern of which way it was done. Was it circular like a, a milling machine cutter? Was it straight like a shaper going back and forth? Like so. Or, um, and then how fast did you feed it into the machine so you get the waviness of it? Uh, and not only that, but the pressure, like it may, when it comes in on this stroke, it may bend it and what have you. So, anyhow, roughness is that given surface, you know, the way it's cut. And then, depending how fast it was cut, and then the lay is the, the, the lay of the cutting tool marks on it, if that makes it easier to here they show just a flaw, you know. May have had a hollow section inside uh, the cast iron piece that you were machining or something. Had some bubbles in it or whatever. But anyhow, uh, the lay is, you know, the way in which the machine cuts. And the lay could be rounded, you know, and so on. And then depending how fast it's fed, it could be wavy like that. So... These are things that they measure. So we look here is from your highest point to your highest point, and then that has the valley in it, peaks and valleys. That's your waviness width. Roughness width is just all the you know ups and downs of the surface. So that's your roughness width is smaller than obviously your waviness width. And then the lay direction, you know, like, what's the machine going back and forth cutting it? For instance, we talked about surface grinders. You know how it went back and forth in a reciprocating action. So you would get something maybe like this versus like a milling cutter where the actual tool is spinning when it's cutting into it. You'd see round marks like that. All right, enough said about that. Uh, da, da. And then here is some of the symbols they have for that. Um, and here, if it's parallel marks, and if it's perpendicular, and then let's say the thing cuts this way, and then it cuts that way to level it in different patterns. And it shows you parallel, perpendicular, um, and then this one, like I said, if it's cutting both ways. Here it's multi-directional. It can go any which way. Here's a circular. Here, and I guess this one's a regular where it starts in and goes out. All right, well, anyhow, that's enough of... So if you happen to see that and you wonder, what on earth does all that mean and all those symbols? Well, now you know. And it's important. That way you can know if you need to slow down your feed rate because of the waviness of it. Or, and then the surface texture marks, you'll know what that means if you're like reading a blueprint or something and you see these M's and, and what have you. Alright, we'll keep moving here. Um, gear milling. 
uh, a multi-point machining process in which individual tooth spacings are created by a rotating multi-edge cutter having a cross-section similar to that of the generated teeth. Yeah. All right, so you say, what on earth does that mean? And don't worry, I'll show you some videos. After cutting each shape, the cutter is returned to its initial position and the blank is indexed for the next cut. So let's see if I got it here. Okay, so this is just regular gear milling. So that means you just have a regular standard milling machine. You don't have these specialty machines, which we'll talk about gear hoppers and gear shapers. Special machines, that's all they do. A milling machine can mill out different surfaces, get something flat. It can machine anything where you're making you know, square rectangular objects and cut out pockets inside them and stuff like that. Milling machine it can also drill holes if it had to and, and do all kinds of stuff. So it's multi-purpose, but it can cut gears, but it's slower. Now again, the reason you have a gear hobber and a gear shaper is if you're making a lot of gears, that's all it does, and it does it that much faster, which I'll show you in the upcoming videos. See, I'm piquing your interest, so you'll watch this. All right, anyhow. Now, for a milling machine, because you just have the one cutter there, you cut a tooth, and you got to figure out how many teeth it needs ahead of time, which we'll get into the charts and all that. You figure out what's the diameter, what size is the gear, what's the ratio, and this and that, and they'll automatically tell you, well, you're going to need, let's say, 64 teeth, and then, and, and what size, and so what it'll do is, then what you do is you move this indexing head, where you pull this thing out, and you can put it in one of these holes. Depending on where you have it set in these holes, it will, after you uh, rotate it one revolution, it will move at one space where then it'll do the next gear tooth. And then the next gear tooth, where it's, depending on how many you figure out for the 64, then you put it in one of these special holes in that. And I, I forget each one. There's, a, there's two different ways to do it. And it comes with a manual. You just look at it. But anyhow, you pull this out. You put it in there to, let's say, the corresponding number of teeth that you would need. So we divide this up into 64 even spaces. And so, so that way, when you spin it around and go to cut the last tooth, it's going to, let's say it's the end of the spur gear, it's going to come in and mate with that other spur gear that comes up, the actual tooth. So it doesn't do like, it doesn't end up with a half a tooth or something is what I'm saying. And then if you go to do this and engage, let's say, something, a machine part, or engage uh, some gearing in your gearbox for your car, yeah, <laughs> it's going to make a heck of a noise because you've only got a half of a space for a tooth there. It's going to break off that other tooth, then you're going to have some slop there. And that's not good. So that's what that does. It takes longer because you have to cut one tooth, rotate it once, cut the next tooth, rotate it once. Well, you can see. But if you're just making odds and ends specialty parts, you're not making any batches. Uh, you just custom make everything for people. Uh, you're just a little machine shop or whatever, then this is fine. Okay. <clears throat> and it's showing you. Now this thing rotates, you cut one tooth, rotates, cuts the next tooth. That's what I'm saying. You don't want it to wear when you end up cutting the last one. You end up with a half a tooth here because this overlaps into that. All right, and all the different types of gear teeth that you can make. Helical tooth. It's got a little pitch angle to it. Sprocket. You know, like you see that for your chain gear drives on your bicycles. Beveled gears. A regular spur gear where it's just straight up and down doesn't have any angle to it. Okay, let's go spurs. Yeah, that was that was rigged, man. Okay. All right, anyhow, next one. Here is our before blanks that we start out with to make these gears, and then we cut the gears, and that's what we get. Look, a pinion gear, you know, rack and pinion steering, bevel gear. Uh, there's your spur gear. There's a rack there. Uh, there's a rack and there's the pinion. So I can move it. So it's, it's a, gears are a way of changing direction of motion and stuff like that. That's why I talk about rear end as in the back of your car, your differential, where it takes it and then that the big gear in the back with the other gears that go onto your axles and all that. And so then it takes that drive shaft, takes that spinning and then your, your, your big gear in there and then changes the direction of it to go the other way for the axle 90 degrees 
And so there you go. So you got to make sure you have a big, heavy-duty rear end if you if you bump up the horsepower in your car. So you know sometimes you have to take that rear end. That's why they'll say, do you have a 10 bolt or 12 bolt rear end? And people look and they'll say, excuse me. And you say, no, no, no. I'm talking about the differential. You know, in your car. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyhow. There's some pictures of them. There's a worm gear where they're rounded and they're at that angle for transverse motion and stuff like that, like I was talking here. Helical or spiral gears. Bevel gears. Yeah, it's changing the direction there of the motion. Let's say if this was the axle and it's the other way. That was coming in from the drive shaft. Bevel gears. All right, well, enough of that. Gear milling. Uses a rotating form cutter. Gear blanks are indexed after each cut, so you have to turn the wheel and it moves it, indexes it one notch. Will require deburring. Gear teeth are produced individually. It's time consuming, a low production process. Only used if you don't have access to gear hobbing or shaping. Okay. All right, gear hobbing. All right, speak of the devil. A multi-point machining process in which gear teeth are progressively generated by a series of cuts with a helical cutting tool, which is a hob. All right, hob's in there. Uh, both the hob and the workpiece revolve in a constant relationship as the hob is fed across. And again, you'll type in, you know, what size is your gear blank, what size is your hob, you figure out that set up you set it all up and it gradually moves it in and rotates and like I said I'll show you a video and then it will all make sense here's a machine here is the gear blank here is this little bit of an angle there you'll see this little bit of an angle see there's the cutter tool and then it's progressively cutting this is spinning this is spinning and then a lot of times you'll see cutting fluid flowing down here this one you don't and then it's gradually cutting it in, notching it, and notching it, notching until it gets the whole gear in there, beveled at an angle. And there it is doing it. Uh, and there's a gear hob right there, and there it is on its little shaft, and it's cutting all this. And then it progressively cuts these, spins the spins around. This is misleading. I guess somebody just drew this. But it's cutting them all, and then it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and further down, further down, further down, further down, until it cuts it all the way through. You wouldn't see just some teeth, and then that. Now, that's more of uh, what you'd be doing with a regular just milling machine. All right, anyhow, and you see it has all these pieces and reliefs in there so the chips can get flying out of there and all that. Let's see, I'm going to cross my fingers if this YouTube clip works, because you know how those come and go. I thought I checked them, hopefully they work. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, listen to music. Alright, that's it. See how it took that blank and look how it's cutting. This is spinning and that's spinning. They got the right relationship of spinning. And it will cut the gear. See how it's cutting at an angle, but then it just keeps going down in depth. So it gets to a certain depth and it cuts it the whole length of this blank here. And it does it so easy. And, look, and then here is where the cutting fluid's going down and cleaning out this gear hob as it's cutting. Hopefully you can hear me over this precious music here, but anyhow, just want to jam. Oh, I'm sorry, I better stop. But look how much faster this is. Can you imagine having to cut each gear tooth at a time and all that? And, you know, within a few, well, a minute or two uh, of my antics, uh, it's already done for you. You just can't beat that, can you? Let's get back to where we were here. Alright, and then, so that's gear hobbing pretty fast there. Let's see what this one is. This one's any better. Oh yeah, here's for a big one. See how it's working at it? So then it'll get a deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then it'll go cut it all the way up to the end. I believe. Did it do it on this one? Yeah, it'll cut it to the end. 
cut this one, and then now it's cutting this part. And it just takes a while because this is a big piece, and it's got how fast it has to rotate the actual part, and then the actual gear hop. And it's flushing out all that stuff. So, you know, this one's a pretty big machine. I think you get the drift. I will keep it moving here. All right. And so again, there's the actual cutter. And then there's your workpiece. See what I'm saying? It progressively goes around, cuts, and keeps getting deeper and deeper until it goes, and then keeps getting further and further back till it cuts the whole gear out. All right, makes sense. And there's all the little pieces. And there they have it where the actual on this one, yeah, you got the tool here, and you got the workpiece mounted this way. So, I mean, you can do it however you want to do it. It, it doesn't matter. Every machine, you know, they got special reasons they do it their way or what have you, or, or to get around patents. All right, and then again, all the different types of gears and what you can do and the tools. So gear uh, hobbing is gear generating process using a helical hob cutter. Cutters and blanks rotate in a time relationship. Maintains proportional feed rates. It's gradually working its way down till it cuts the whole gear. Uh, cuts several teeth on a progressive basis and is used for high production runs. And you saw that one when it was, I guess it was cutting that piece of aluminum that cut it quick. Uh, now we get into gear shaping. This one's different where here's the piece, here's the blank, here's the cutter. It goes up and down. And this is rotating. And it's cutting it out. So let's see if this video works. I hope it does. I wonder if this is a Drummond. I wonder if it's a Maxi Cut 200. I guess it is. All right, come on. Yeah, yeah, let me see. And here it goes. Here's the cutter. See? And then it's sending all that lubricant to flush it all out. And then it just keeps cutting it deeper and deeper. So, and that's how that one cuts. Pretty slick, huh? I don't think you get the drift. I did not say that. Alright, so, anyhow, we'll keep moving here. So, again, here is, uh, I guess this one's the cutter on this one. And uh, it's got a big tool. It's cutting a smaller gear here. And this is going back and forth. And then this is rotating around at a certain speed enough to where this is rotating too. And they keep, they stay in sync so it doesn't mess up the gears, obviously. Again, this was going up and down the actual tool. And there's one there. So it uses a gear-shaped cutter that is reciprocated and rotated in relationship to the blank to produce the gear teeth. Cutters rotate in a timed relationship with the workpiece. Again, you can make all kinds of gears. What, what they use this a lot for is it's better. It can go inside. It can do internal gears. And that's where you see this more often because it takes a little longer to do than the gear hobbing. And uh, I've noticed that's where I see a lot of the gear shapers being used. It's mainly for a lot of your internal cuts. Unless that's the only thing you've got. I mean, it can do both. Don't get me wrong. Now we get into NTM, non-traditional machining. The only time you use non-traditional machining is when the other standard machining processes will not work. Because this is more expensive, more time-consuming, the whole nine yards. But you'll see it gives you real nice, precise things uh, in parts that you know you couldn't make any other way. So it opens the door to creating new products. And that's why this became big. So you got different types. Non-mechanical. Does not produce a chip. Does not produce a lay pattern. You know, we talked about. Does not involve compression or shear forces often involves new energy modes. So again, that's the uh, non-mechanical. This is a 
overhead somebody had produced a long time ago. I never liked those. You should be indented. All right, so anyhow, <clears throat> non-traditional advantages. Again, our NTM, in case you see that on the quizzes and final exam, you'll know, what's this NTM? What is he talking about? Okay. So we have enough acronyms in this world. Yes, we do. Reduces energy and has no chip disposal. Less heat input, less distortion and surface cracking. Eliminates cutting forces, reduces deformation and uh, residual stresses. All right, that's good. So we'll talk about that one. And then we'll, we'll show you uh, more and more of these. Uh, <clears throat> oh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me see if I got this right here. One, two, three, four. Yeah, okay. We're going to break it down that way. So then our four main groups of non-traditional machine are chemical. All right, so here a chemical reaction sometimes enhanced by electrical or thermal energy. Um, under this one, you have your immersion chemical milling and you have your photo etching. Uh, then we have electrochemical where you can have this, but then with the addition of electrical currents and stuff, you can enhance this and make it go faster, uh, depending on what you're trying to cut thicker and stuff. Like this is good for thin stuff, which we'll get into putting a photo mask on stuff. I think we go through these step by step. If not, I'll go back. Let me look before I forget. Yes. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> I got myself out of whack on this, so let me just make sure we got it right. Non-traditional machining means for all of this, for all of them, all of these processes involved. And and, and I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself is what I did. Is it is non-mechanical because you will see that through various types of liquids, which we'll talk about on some of them. And through others, um, let me see what the other one, yeah, other devices, but they're not mechanical like, for instance, machining. We think of a milling machine where it cuts something and these big chips come out. It's mechanical action. It's rotating or something, even with a lathe, with a drill and all that. It's a mechanical thing, it produces these big chips that fly on all this. Although you will see with this non traditional machining, where it dissolves in that, you know, produces real fine, small little chips that you don't see versus. So they say it does not produce a chip per se, you know, a big hunking chip. It just dissolves the little particles. Okay. So yeah, let's put it that way. And then you don't see a pattern because it's removing such a small amount at one time. So yeah, this was right. I'm sorry. So anyhow, just remember it's not a mechanical thing where it's gouging out big chunks of things, and big chips flying out everywhere and all this. This is for fine, delicate things or things where you, parts where you need a very fine, perfect cut finish. Could be you're cutting materials that are just so hard that we don't have cutting tools that will cut them. And that's why we have these non-traditional type machining processes. Again, which we'll cover in a second here. Alright, uh, and again, like I said, you don't really have to worry about the chip disposal, although it is smaller little pieces and strainers and stuff like that. You do end up having to clean out the stuff, but it's not like these big chunks of chips flying out everywhere and, and what have you. I mean, the material's got to go somewhere. right? But you're making such, usually, finer, more precise, thinner cuts that you don't have the amount of material, the saw curves, I should say, the amount of material that's been removed is so fine and thin that you just don't have to worry about this big chip disposal problem. And because it's so fine, because it's being done slowly and gradually, you don't have as much distortion, any distortion, per se, on some at all, or very little distortion. 
and hardly any surface cracking, if any, depending on the type of non-traditional machining that we are talking about. Uh, and because it's so little, uh, that reduces the deformation and all the stresses that have been put on something that's been hit and hammered and cut and all that. You're not having that because it's so gradual. So it eliminates these cutting forces. All right, now we'll get back on Beth. I'm sorry about that. All right, so our chemical type. Chemical reaction sometimes enhanced by electrical or thermal energy. Uh, and this one's mainly, that's all it's set up on. Immersion, chemical milling, and basically you, uh, you mask off, and really even masking tape, something that has a gooey stick -a in it. Uh, that's why they call it a masking tape for instance, you know, for not just painting something, but let's say it's metal, and then you pour an acid on it that dissolves the metal or plastic or whatever it may be. And wherever that tape was on top, it doesn't dissolve that. It only dissolves the part that did not have that tape to protect it. Now, the only bad thing is if you're trying to do thick parts, it's going to take a long time. Plus, since the tape only covered the top, then it's going to etch away at the sides kind of beveled you have a little bit of an angle there coming back in. So you gotta worry about that. Then photo etching, what they're doing there, instead of applying that masking tape on by hand, or let's say these are pre-cuts that someone has to lay down and rub them on and peel them off and whatever, you have photo etching where this is sprayed on a photoresist material, it's exposed to light, then that photoresist material hardens like and turns into like kind of like that tape or whatever, and then you do it that way so it's quicker and easier to do it. So PCM, photochemical milling or photo etching. Electrochemical uses an electrolytic dissolution. So we have ECM. And it's kind of the reverse of electroplating. Electroplating is when you use these certain chemicals and depending how you do it, you plate the metal and you can make something where it's chrome plated. Okay, where you're adding the material wants to go to it. This is the reverse where it's dissolving and cutting away the metal. All right. Then we have a mechanical type per se of NTM, which you say, well, I thought you just said we this whole thing is not mechanical and stuff. Well, it's fine mechanical, meaning it's done a different way. Like ultrasonic is done through vibratory process through a horn in that and the way it vibrates, it vibrates the molecules. You see the ultrasonic line in plastics and then it'll cause them to fuse together or to actually cut it. Uh, and then water jet is a high pressure water spray like, uh, like you know in your faucet, I guess if you checked on a meter you get a lot, what, about 10 PSI coming from the city for your water pressure and then you put it in a faucet and it condenses it more and you know you can get up to 20, 30 depending and then like you get those shower picks and stuff that you can put on the jets and then you're getting somewhere 30, 40 psi you know massaging things and like that depending how fine you make that orifice for the water well with the water jet and the pressures you can get up 60, 70, 80 90, I think they said, because we went to that one in Kilgore, and the guy bought the latest one. And you can get it about to about 96, 97,000 PSI. Can you imagine that? Uh, I think, what is it that the, uh, what is it, 60 or 80 PSI, the car wash, you know, for cleaning your car. And, you know, you get hit by that, and it's kind of like, you know, like hit your eye and that can knock it out. So just imagine 96,000 PSI of this. And it says any f more than that with the pressure, it just vaporizes into the air and just makes it uh, more humid. You lose the actual pressure because it just it breaks down. So you can't really get out to 100,000 PSI as of yet. Give them another year and they'll figure out a way to do that. Thermal uses high temperatures in very localized regions. So you had electrochemical where you had some chemical and some 
electricity and that process helped dissolve it quicker than just the regular chemical. Then you get into thermal where uh, you use electricity in that you're using it through uh, the tools that conduct electricity. And so you can get some high. And what it is, it's spark erosion. This electrical discharge machining, they have it where it can be a wire or whatever, where it leaves a little bit of gap between your material that you're cutting and the actual wire or um, the cavity type where you can have it in the shape of whatever you want. Let's say it's in the shape of this soda can and it goes down into this piece of metal and it's going to cut out a piece, a hole like the size of this soda can. And what it does is it leaves enough space between the material and the can and it creates these little like uh, lightning bolts, sparks like in a spark plug, you know, there's a gap in a spark plug, same thing, and then every time it sparks, it's eaten away, it's pitting that metal until it's dissolving it into very fine little, like I said, particles that are cleaned off. And it keeps going down until it eats as far as you want it to go. Now this could be in the shape of some weird looking stamp, and that way you could be making your original uh, molds for making coins and what have you. It's interesting what you can do with all this stuff. And then we'll have some examples for you. But that's considered thermal, the electrical discharge machine. All right, so chemical machining material is removed from select areas by immersing it in a chemical reagent. So something that will obviously dissolve that material, similar to corrosion or chemical dissolution of a metal. And here, a chemical process, uh, immersion chemical, which is part of chemical, really. Let's say we put some masking tape here, masking tape here, and then we put it in that tank of acid, and it will dissolve everything that isn't masked. And it's kind of interesting. You think it would, well, just where the tape is, then it'll go right back around, dissolve everything under. No, it kind of follows it. And it's the way that... Uh, it sits in there and they have the flow going straight down on it. And it actually leaves us. Like I said, it'll taper it in a little bit. But it's kind of interesting how that works. And then here are your little things. You got to clean the metal first, you know, pickle it, etch it, uh, and then rinse the acid off. And then so you can either do this by hand or this can be a big, huge automated machine that does it automatically, which would be better. And again, with your chemical milling, see the agitator there. See how it comes in just a little under there and does it. It's interesting how that works. Once it sets it up, then it's pretty good. And then you can have heating elements or cooling keep an accurate temperature and it dissolves better at a certain temperature. So it's better if you can do that. And then what you do is you leave something so you can pick it up. So you have to put your hands in there and grab the thing, you can just pick it up with this little hook. There's a threaded part or something. In there. And what they're saying is real thin parts. Now, I don't know if you remember if any of you did any drafting in the day when they had uh, drafting boards and that, but they had little eraser shields, flat little pieces of thin metal, like this business card, thin like that, it was made out of metal, had little holes in it, so if you like drew an arrowhead too big or something, you could get in there and then take your eraser over it. And it would only erase that one little spot that was open in this eraser shield. And it would hide the rest from being erased so you won't erase the whole section and have to redraw and smudge it and make a mess. So find little parts inside something if it needs just a thin piece of metal on top of a plastic piece. So you can say it's conducting one part and made this thin little daisy wheel. So the before and afters, you know, even airplane, thin airplane panels and stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so anyhow, there's like an eraser shield. So you, know, you can erase the line without erasing the rest of your drawing, the tips, all kinds of stuff. So, I know you're thinking, what is that? Well, anyhow, I know some of you have seen that. <coughs> So parts are immersed in acidic or basic chemical rate. So it just depends on what the material is. Uh, masks protect areas from being chemically milled, produces close tolerances and fine detail, requires no finishing of workpiece services. Yeah, when you're through, you're through. 
you're done. It's good, like I said, for thin materials, because if you try to stamp a thin material, it gets wavy because it presses it where it's cutting that piece out, and then so it causes it to get wavy. This doesn't. It, the whole shield stays nice and flat. Photo etching, the same thing like before, uh, but with this one, you the unmask areas or metallic or non-metallic parts. Yeah, it's going to etch through the parts that aren't masked, just like in the chemical. The mask and geometry is photographically exposed on a workpiece using ultraviolet light. Back when we uh, actually, there were courses in photography. In fact, I used to teach it down in uh, when I was working at another university at A&M Kingsville down there by Corpus Christi. And we had this big dark room when they did that. And you would expose it in those enlargers and that, and you'd have the film and then wherever the light hit it through uh, <coughs> all your negative and that the black part of your negative would hide the light and then the other light would expose it so then that part would become white and the negative part where it's not exposed or vice versa would become black so anyhow it's the reverse of what you get on the picture God, it's been a while. Jeez. But anyhow, I used to be able to rattle that off like nothing. But I guess it's good to forget because people do bad things to you and that way you forget about that. All right, parts produced by photo etching are generally thin gauge, flat, and complex in design. And then this shows you a typical setup of all the different chambers involved. The before and after. Again, I was exposed to all this stuff, and then it dissolved all that other stuff away. So that's kind of neat. And then it's not wavy or anything. It's nice and flat. So common form of chemical blanking uh, uses a chemical cutting agent or reagent, whatever you want to call it. Requires a and, and cutting agent means like you know an acid or a base, depending on what type of material you're trying to. Uh, dissolve. Requires a pattern created by photoresist material that we had talked about so when exposed to light it hardens it. Produces accurate burr free complex thin gauge parts and we're talking what a tenth of a thousandth to fifty thousandths of an inch so not real thick. Then we get into ECM electrochemical machining. Yes I know I'm putting you to sleep I'm sorry. Electrolytic <clears throat> material removal process involving a negatively charged shaped electrode, which is your cathode, and then a conductive fluid electrolyte, and a conductive workpiece is your anode. Positive. So ECM is characterized as reverse of electroplating, like I was saying. So instead of depositing material on the metal, you're removing the metal. So here is our machine part. Here is your blank that you start out with. Because again, you're not going to want to try to do a big thick thing like that and remove all of this material. It takes a long time. So the more you can remove what I'm saying is through a traditional method, the better. And then it dissolves the rest. And it just seems to work better that way. You say, well, I could have dissolved that deep. Couldn't have done all that. And then it would just take that much longer. I don't know what it is, but when you're having to do other things to it, it just takes forever. So anyhow. And then it's showing you how it's working. Uh, the insulated uh, anode here and then the cathode. Yeah, which is, I guess, your workpiece, your part. And the electrolyte that it's shooting out into it, leaving a gap, and then it's wanting to um, dissolve between the two. And so then it flushes it out. <clears throat> so, big deal here is versus, uh, we'll get into non traditional machining as in with the EDM, the electrical discharge machining. So many acronyms, I'm sorry. It's hard to keep up. I know, that's why you have to study for these quizzes. I know I have to. Has no electrode wear with this one. With your EDM, electrical discharge machining, which we're going to talk about in a minute. 
Here we did electrochemical, ECM, but we're going to talk about ED. There the actual electrode does wear out after a while. Uses the principle of electrolysis, the reverse of electroplating, requires no masking of materials, uh, requires electrically conductive workpieces. Uh, the tool is shaped on what, whatever you want cut out. That's what is going to be removed, the shape of the actual tool. tool. So it has the shape tools, which is, I'm sorry, the cathode. Uh, then produces good tolerances and surfaces, has no electrical wear, and can produce complex geometry, typically in one fell sweep. You don't have to do it this way and then have another one that comes down. It depends how convoluted and how integrated and uh, precise and uh, wild looking this part is. And we get into lasers, then we'll get into EDM and the other stuff too. But you have laser beam machining, you have laser welding, laser cutting, then you have laser beam machining. There are two main types of industrial lasers. You have the medium, yttrium, aluminum, garnet. You always see this ND YAG. Well, now I see why. Who's going to rattle all that off? Unless you're Russian. I guess you can rattle that off pretty good. Uh, lasers are solid state units that are ideal for marking, drilling small holes, and making intricate cuts. Now, these ND YAG are for more small precise. We're going to talk about the CO2 type as well. There's two main types. They emit a wavelength of 1.06 micrometers. Now I'm not going to expect you to remember that. Have an average output of, well this is kind of interesting, so you'll know the difference between the other one, from 100 to 400 watts of power. Which if you think about it, you get a 100 watt light bulb. All right, so, okay, I, I, I can handle that. Oxygen gas is sometimes used to increase cutting speed and the quantity, or the quality, I'm sorry, for how smooth that cut is. <clears throat> now you get into the carbon dioxide where you're adding CO2 in here. Lasers are a mixture of helium, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide, depending on your bottled gases for this. They emit a wavelength of, you looked at the other one, where was it? Wavelength of 1.06 micrometers, and that's why it's different. 10.6, all right, so 10 times more, and are more powerful than the ND YAG lasers that we we're talking about. However, they do not leave as smooth an edge as the YAG, and they have a noticeable heat-affected zone. CO2 lasers average, look, 250 to 5,000 watts, when these are, what, 100 to 400. Since these lasers are more powerful, they have the ability to heat treat weld and can cut thicker materials. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. If you're dealing with smaller little objects that you're manufacturing, you know, maybe for the electronic business, well, then go with the ND egg. But if you're doing bigger, heavier stuff, then obviously this, the carbon dioxide lasers are better. Metals, stainless steel, steel alloys, laminated steel plates, aluminum, titanium, copper, and brass. I mean, Plastics, rubber, leather, wood, textile. The beauty of lasers, what they're saying, is it can almost cut through anything. Whether it's plastic, graphite, ceramic, it just cuts through it. Now, if you had, let's say, a regular bandsaw or a table saw and you're trying to cut ceramic, what's going to happen? It's going to hit, let's say, ceramic as in a piece of glass. You take that glass and try to cut it with... <laughs> With a table saw, yeah, it's brittle. It's going to shatter on you, and there's broken pieces everywhere. With a laser, it's that fine little laser cut. It's just cutting etch through that all day long. So, anyhow, that is the beauty of the laser. Good edge quality, freedom from distortion, no deformation, uh, lack of tooling costs, great precision, cost-effective when batch quantity is low and you want high quality. Plus, usually when you're done, it gives you such a nice cut, you don't have to then go and do another finishing operation. Because let's say if you're cutting a piece of wood with a table saw, it may be rough and then you gotta sand it and all this. This would give you a nice perfect cut. In fact, it would burn that edge where it would leave a black or a brown edge 
on it so you'd only have to stain the top edge and you wouldn't even have to finish the sides. When with the table saw, no, you'd have to finish it or it's going to swell on you later. It's going to get moisture in there. Uh, high speed welds, no filler metal is necessary with the laser. If you're doing laser welding. We'll get back to welding again. You're saying, no, I thought you said no more welding. Well, I just we have to. The laser can do a lot of good stuff. Quality joints, very small heat affected zones. It's so precise. Reduction in edge preparation costs. It may give you a, a good enough cut where you don't have to do anything with it. Uh, and same with the welding. It's, it's so good you don't have to do anything with it afterwards. Reduced or no material distortion and ease of welding similar or even dissimilar materials. Confuse it enough to where dissimilar materials will hold enough Weld enough together that you're good to go. Uh, but the disadvantages of laser beam machining, slower travel speeds than other processes like plasma we talked about, oxyacetylene. Very high capital equipment costs. Most industrial lasers start at 250000 Although, I was just looking at another, we, I, I get, you know, from these various vendors, and they have a pretty good system now that's at 100000 so it's amazing, and it'll be 50000 Next thing you know, we'll be buying one to play with in the garage or our basement. But here, I guess we don't have many basements. Maintenance costs are high. Material thickness is limited. Three-quarters of an inch steel. Still, that's pretty thick, three-quarters of an inch. You know, like three-quarters of an inch plywood, the thick plywood. Most of the top of your surfaces for uh, tables and stuff are three-quarter. Uh, then we get into water jet machining. Water is forced through tiny nozzles, uh, five thousandths of an inch to twenty-five thousandths under high pressures, thirty to ninety thousand psi. Wow! To cut almost any material with no heat-affected zone and distortion, because it's water, it's cool, right? When abrasives instead of water are used, this process, they say, is to now abrasive jet. I've heard people say this, but it really isn't. Abrasive jet's a whole nother operation, so don't get confused by that. All right, uh, water jet operations, trimming, do shape cutting, drilling, cleaning and removing. Uh, like I said, they, they were cutting out blanks, and they could cut out the state of Texas and nice. I've got um, some pieces in my office. I need to bring them in show them on this video, but you really can't see it as well as actually seeing it. So next time you're in my office, I'll show you all the different ones. I've got an object that was cut by laser, one that was cut by this water jet. With water jet comes in real smooth, then when it comes out, you know, because it's, it's breaking down that water stream, then it comes out kind of more of an angle beveled on the outside edge of it, depending how thick it is, you can see it. Then I have EDM wire, and then I have a stud welder, Things. So I've got a few little examples, so next time you're, you come by you want to see me, you can look at all that good stuff. Good for pretty much anything. It's such a fine stream of water. You can cut paper with it. It's not going to cause the paper to swell up. It's very fine, cuts it fast, and it moves on. And then this thing, you know, cutting through paper, oh my god, the travel rates are just like... I mean, it's not there long enough to soak the paper to ruin it. Headliners, you name it, gives you a nice smooth cut through all the stuff. Advantages of water jet machining, no heat distortion, small curve, dust free, heat free, you know, so you don't have that heat affected zone, does not generate toxic elements, you know, it's water. No pulse machining is required, operating costs are low, very little or no clamping. Travel speeds, look at this, 500 inches per minute. That's pretty darn fast. Disadvantages is and you got water going through a very small orifice. So it's pretty high decibels, 80 to 100 decibels. Unable to machine blind holes or pockets. Um, they're saying when it cuts, it cuts all the way through. You can't really adjust the depth, but if you want it to cut, a material it has to have a certain amount of PSI and then if you reduce that then it won't even get through the initial surface of the thing so you can't cut halfway through material it's gonna cut all the way through uh, 
like I said, most machines are a hundred decent machine is a hundred thousand or more. And here somebody took an old Xbox machine and cut it with a water jet. And look how smooth that is. I mean, it looks like that's actually something you bought. I mean, it gives you a nice, clean cut. It cut it where the X was in the Xbox. I know my kids still have one upstairs, and they like it because there's some games there that they, I guess because they always win at them. But anyhow, um, that they like, and they still use that machine, and they drop it and everything. And that's when they made them real well. You couldn't break them. Then they realized, ooh, that's not good. And then they had those Xbox 360s that are all overheated, and, and you have to buy the fans that click on the back of them, and all this other stuff. It drives me bananas. Now we're finally in electrical discharge machining, the thermal process. See, yeah, we got the red letters here. How about that? Cuts metal by discharging electrical current stored in a bank of capacitors, and then it goes across a thin gap between the tool which is the cathode and the workpiece, which is the anode. Yeah, all of these, I'm sorry, in case you get mixed up or I made a mistake, the tool is typically the cathode and the workpiece is the anode. Um, where is this? Yeah, it's removes electrically conductive material. So like, like I said, any material that conducts electricity, types of metals and stuff like that, right? even graphite, by means of rapid controlled repetitive spark discharges. A dielectric fluid is used to flush the removed particles, regulate the discharge, and keep the tool and workpiece cool. So dielectric means the reverse of, so it doesn't conduct electricity. So it leaves that little gap in there of it flushing. it. And a lot of it's just different motor oils will do that. But they're special oils just for this. And it's showing you, I always call it fish tank machining. Um, I guess this one's a wire. Yeah, wire EDM. Yeah, there it is. Because the whole thing is heated up, lights up. Um, and usually they use some type of brass, very thin brass, and there's other different, I think we'll tell you in a minute here. And there's the spool of wire in that. And once you use it, it's shot. You can't reuse it. And then the pickup wheel for the used pieces. Um, and you cut through it just like it's a bandsaw, only it's like fine string, and it can make super thin saw curves. Yeah, and again, and then it has that dielectric fluid in there, so it gets immersed in there. And again, like I said, it's fish tank machining, because a lot of times this is clear plexiglass, so you can look inside, too, and see it going on. And uh, so it kind of looks like a fish tank in there. This one's a cavity-type EDM, which means the work pace, like we talked about that chemical machining. However, I cut this thing out and usually these are made out of um, graphite and if you've seen pencil lead right which is graphite you can carve that with a knife so you can carve this any shape you want and when this goes down it's going to leave the impression whatever the shape is and then come back up it gradually wears down a little at a time each time you use it but uh, that's just the way it is and so then it leaves a cavity of the shape versus the other one is like a band saw I can cut pieces out Anyhow, here is the before blanks, and here is the after. So, like I said, it's better to cut out as much material as you can. And then with a cavity type, it was in the shape, let's say, of this hexagon shape here. And it came down, only went that deep, didn't go the rest of the depth, and cut that out. Same with this, you could have had uh, a graphite tool that was shaped like, let's say, an Elmer's glue bottle or something, I don't know, whatever that is, or a coat of arms, and that comes down a certain depth, and then it comes back up. And then that's what you get. Look, you got a nice coining die. Coat of arms there looks sharp. Okay, well, let's move on. So again, there's the cavity type where whatever this is, that's the shape, the impression that you're going to get into your part, your workpiece. And there is the actual electrode, and there is the corresponding shape that you're getting. You see that's rectangular shape there. There's the rectangular shape. There's that stuff there. There's these little fine splines, and then there are that. 
So, advances a shaped tool, this is the cavity type, to within sparking, arcing distance, and then it just gradually eats away through that. So anyhow, tools and work pieces must be electrically conductive. Again, it's controlled um, by uh, rapid, controlled, repetitive spark discharges. And you can goose it up, you can change the gap voltage by goosing up the current, the voltage, what have you. But with that cavity, it will give you like a rough surface like it's been uh, sandblasted, kind of got that rough texture to it. So at the end, you may want to change it to where you ease up on it and it doesn't spark as hard, and then you get a finer finish. So Then if you can do it for that uh, EDM wire, EDM cavity, why can't you do it with grinding as well? So a thermal mass, or EDM grinding, a thermal mass reducing process that uses a rotated conductive wheel to remove electrically conductive material by means of controlled repetitive spark. Again, same thing, uh, only this time we have a rotating wheel. And then that's what dissolves it again under a fish tank type deal. And it removes it. It gives you a finer real fine smooth finish depending how you goose it up and what have you. Finer than even your uh, actual regular grinding whether it's surface grinding, you know, the, the different type of grinding processes that we previously covered. And again it looks like a regular uh, surface grinder setup. So same basic thing, only it's using a grinding wheel that conducts electricity and all that. Uh, and then the wire, like I said, you're using a thin wire to cut it. Um, and there it is. It's got its take-up wheel uh, at the bottom and then the actual wheel of the material. Or it may be reversed, but usually that's where it is, where it's got the equipment to turn it around. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the thickness of the wire, thousandth of an inch. Your human hair is three to four thousandths thick, or thicker. Some of you, of course, your hair, mine's not too thick. But anyhow, uh, to, uh, what is this? Hundreds or twelve thousandths of an inch in diameter. So anyhow, it makes thin, and, and it's thinner than this, really. This looks thick. That's too thick. All right, let's see if this will work, or if we have a commercial or something. Oh, yeah, this is kind of neat. These guys, I guess they make EDM wire, I mean, or EDM wire machine. Well, let's see what they do. Making parts with highly detailed, extraordinarily tough shapes yeah, and tight that. tolerances can be nearly impossible with conventional machining techniques, but not with a wire EDM process. Imagine being able to that. make precise cuts in metal with Ooh. a blade no thicker than a human hair. That's awesome. That's what wire EDM can do. EDM stands for Electrical Discharge Machining. But instead of a blade like a bandsaw, wire EDM uses an electrically charged hair-thin wire to remove microscopic particles and yeah. shape the part. These animations help show how wire EDM works. The wire carries one side of the charge. Conductive material carries the other side of the charge. And when the two get close, a white-hot electrical spark jumps the gap, melting away tiny dust particle-sized pieces of metal. Two microns are smaller. Wow. How small is a micron? Well, if this was the diameter of a human hair, this would be a micron. But what's all this liquid? Well, that's the dielectric. Deionized water, really, useful because it doesn't conduct electricity. In wire EDM, the liquid dielectric controls the sparking, cools the process, and flushes away those tiny particles as they're removed. All very fast, about a million sparks per second. The particles themselves are each about the size of a particle of smoke. In the right hands, wire EDM can be used to hold really tight tolerances create incredibly complex shapes, work with difficult materials that may be extremely hard or soft, and if needed, make really, really small parts. There's even something called small hole EDM for working from the inside of the hole to the outside. All completely automated and CNC controlled. No human involvement. At Exact, wire EDM is all we do. We're very good at it.
making us the perfect wire EDM partner to produce complex precision parts that often can't be made any other way. Look at that. Like Ooh. this. Looks like one part. Wow. <laughs> it's is really that two. Exactly. And this springy thing is just one part. Look at that. Want to see more? Watch more of our videos or call for an appointment. You've been watching how wire EDM works. At ex all right, well, anyhow, I, just, I thought, you know, you listen to me talk about all these things, and you go, what is he babbling about? So it's nice to show a few video clips. I know it gets lengthy, but it does help explain these things a little better. So again, if you look at this, uh, arcing distance of the workpiece is about a thousandth of an inch. The actual wire is a thousandth of an inch or thicker. Removes material by rapid, controlled, repetitive spark discharges. And you saw the type of detail you can do with that. It's incredible, isn't it? I'm always fascinated by it. I'm sorry, I get all excited about this. You're probably thinking, oh my God, this guy needs to get a life. I know, I know, but uh, yeah, if you knew my other life. But, but anyhow, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's neat. I, you know, I don't care if you're fascinated by this or not. I think just seeing that and how the precision that you get, it's just amazing. And how, how quickly it can do it now. They used to be pretty slow, but now they're, they're a lot faster. To the point where um, they're making, like I said, parts that can't be made any other way. Uh, so you're, you've got this whole new volume of, of products that are being created that we couldn't even fathom way back when because... There was no way of making them. So anyhow. Then here's our abrasive jet. Like I said, it's different than water. A finishing process which removes material from workpieces by focusing a high-speed stream of abrasive particles carried in air or a gas jet. But uh, the other one is water jet because it's held in water. Hence the name water jet. This is just kind of an old equipment that's a little better what it can do. But, uh, again, you can get, it, it's, also you can get some higher pressures too, or lower pressures. Uh, but, <clears throat> it's more precise than your sandblasting. There's all this equipment involved with it. <clears throat> you know, and it's, it's, it's similar to sandblasting, like I said, but, um, Let's say, for instance, um, you're doing fine detailed stuff for thin materials. And what, what they're doing is like sandblasting is just that. It's sandblasting. You get sand, and you know how coarse sand is. You've been to the beach, okay? Or you've played in a play box, you know, sandbox, I should say. Um, here you can use finer grit materials, different types of materials, very fine. So you can cut thinner materials, like if you use a sandblaster, you, you know, bend real thin materials, and, and it would be too big. So, and then depending on what you're doing, you can go anywhere from, and that's what I'm saying, it has more of a range than just 80 PSI, 25 to 130 PSI, and then let you know what kind of uh, grams of material that it can flow rate. It, it can actually flow, I should say. And then the horsepower requirements for that. So if you look at a sandblaster, I have a two or three horsepower little uh, air compressor and stuff to run that thing. And so depending on how much you want to run, uh, then you have to have more horsepower. Brace of jet machine requires an enclosed workspace and a dust collection system to filter out fine dust particles prior to returning air to the work environment because it's a health hazard. You breathe that in and you get emphysema, where it clogs up all those alveoli in your lungs and you find it very hard to breathe. And it's a horrible way to die. You've seen people, old people walking around with these little oxygen tanks and stuff like that. There's days I felt like that. I know when we visited Arizona and um, uh, I guess we were at Flagstaff and went on the top there of that one mountain there. I forget what it was, but anyhow, then went up that ski lift to the other. Oh my God, I could barely breathe. Luckily, at the top, there was still snow, and this was like, you know, in the middle of June. 
and uh, the, the higher you go, the windier it gets too, and so the air is denser, and then I was okay, but there's that stretch. I guess we're at the 9,000 foot elevation mark, where it's still hot. You don't have the cold snow and the denser air. And man, I could barely breathe. But then we got up to 12,000, well, I guess it was 13,000 feet elevation. And then it was cooler and denser the air, and then I could breathe again. So interesting. So for some of you, you know, have lived in Denver or whatever, you know what I'm talking about. So, anyhow, to sum it all up, uses a high velocity stream of abrasive particles carried in air or gas jet. Not water, because then it becomes water jet. It's used for machining delicate or very hard materials. Produce, produces no heat damage to the workpiece surface. Nozzles are usually made of tungsten or sapphire to resist abrasion. Produces a taper in deep cuts. You know, and I was telling you that it will taper out like, um, like the water jet does. Distance of nozzle from workpiece affects the size of the machined area, obviously. But uh, this was really big, uh, you know, for doing delicate, intricate things. And the units, you can get them for, I've seen a unit for under $10,000 for doing this type of work. Now, if you're doing a lot and you're doing, yeah, I mean, I'd pay the seventy, eighty thousand 80000 on up and get a water jet for doing all kinds of stuff. But then, you know, you do have that um, tank of water and you have these grates where you put that metal on and it cuts it out and all that stuff. So you still have to deal with water. If you want an environment where there's no water involved or whatever, well, then, yeah, this abrasive jet machining. And usually they're smaller setups to do smaller parts and all that. So it just depends on what you're looking for. And then you don't need pumps to pump the water at that high pressure and all that. So... Again, the equipment is less expensive, and it shows you different types. And the different types of material and how fine you can get them super fine to cut other than sodium bicarbonate, glass beads, you name it, very fine stuff. And again, your surface finish, obviously, how close you are to the material, the air pressure, the size of the orifice, the working angle that you hold it, the work means actual workpiece material itself and the actual abrasive that you're using and the diameter of the abrasive. All right, so you will have two quizzes on that, I believe, and that finishes up our uh, grinding, I believe, NTM, the whole nine yards off the look. I think our last part seven is just uh, machining problems, calculating bending forces and angles and stuff like that. I'll check into that. Probably have that one tomorrow, and that should wind it up. And then we'll have a review for the final exam, and then you'll be in good shape. So whenever we're doing this, I forget. You know, I may, may use some of these videos over again. So if we stretch this out to a 15-week thing, then the next week we'll have that one. Then the next week we'll have the final exam or whatever. But anyhow... Um, some interesting stuff. So hopefully this piqued your interest. If you want to look up more on the internet, instead of just wasting your time on Facebook and whatever, you can. So it's amazing how the more you know, the better chance you have at getting a good high paying job. And successful people are the ones that really like what they do. And so on their free time, they read up on it or they actually buy some of this stuff and do some of this and that gives you the upper hand, the advantage over someone else. Even if you get into sales, sales of this type of equipment, there's good money in it. Think about it. This equipment sells some of it for 100000 250000 on up. And after you sell a couple a year, then you get 10% of that on these commissions. And like I said, a lot of these guys in technical sales, I had a guy down in Kingsville. I'd never be a salesman. I'd never. Well, why are we learning woodworking equipment? I'm never going to do it. Then he ends up selling this automated woodworking equipment and he may talk to these people for years then all of a sudden they actually decide to buy that big machining center that's like a half a million dollars from him and then he gets a certain commission on each one like I said five to ten percent or what have you 
All I know, on a bad year, he made 100000 The rest of the years, he made a lot more. And I was kind of almost wanted to go in business with him. But that's when the um, economy tanked. And I said, well, you know, let me just stay here. It's okay. <clears throat> more money you have, I guess the more you waste on foolish things. All I know is the guy's got a lot of hot cars that are really nice. I wish I had. All right, so anyhow, enough said there. We'll continue on next time. So see you next time.